All right, well, let's get this party started. I'm glad you're here. Let's go. My God, we're talking today uh, about the subject matter healed part two. This is a part of our series healed that we're doing. And the point is this, God wants you to be healed. I really want you to lock in on that today and say, God wants me to be healed. Come on, declare that God wants me healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm talking about from the smallest to the largest, God wants you healed. And so this is our effort to help show you and to help build faith in you for that a particular reason because it is God's will uh, for you to be healed. And, and here is why, um, because there is what, whew, let's go to Romans 1 16. Let's start it there. Hallelujah. I thought we was going to do something different, but we're going to just follow what I sense the Holy Ghost telling us to how to open it up today. All right. Come on, I want you to put in the comments, let him cook. <laughs> let him cook. Let him cook. In <laughs> Jesus' name. Glory to God. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. A very familiar passage of scripture for us here at this church. It says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man or the just shall live by faith. Glory to God. All right. So what we understand from this scripture, the Bible is telling us that the gospel, this proclamation, this articulation of the kingdom of, of or excuse me, of the gospel is, it is in itself God's power. It is in itself God's ability, God's strength, God's means for us to experience the power of God for unto salvation. Hallelujah. So it's the gospel message. It is the proclamation, the articulation. It is the revelation or the revealing of the gospel to you that will give you the grace and the ability to enter into the state and or the effects of what we call salvation. Now, salvation uh, is not is not about what happens to you after you die. Um, salvation is not about having a, an insurance policy against going to hell, but more specifically, salvation has to do with an insurance policy over your current life and your current <laughs> experience. Amen. It has to do with how you live on this side of the earth, on this side of eternity, as much as it has to do with what well, on the other side of eternity. So it's not just about what happens when you die, but it's about what's happening in your life when you live. You'll find that many times and mostly in the Old Testament, when we speak of salvation, the Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom Shall I be afraid? There is no concept of death or life after death primarily in the Old Testament. There is no concept of this salvation that happens once you die. But the salvation of the Old Testament, of, of the Bible primarily, is about the experience and quality of your life right now. I want you to shout now. Come on, say it like you had breakfast this morning. Shout now. Hallelujah. And so the reality then becomes then when God says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, he's saying it's the power of God unto establishing the power, the presence, and the state of the righteous right now. And I'm telling you this right now, I feel the Holy Ghost even right now, that God wants to put you in a position to where your life is a life of salvation. Glory to God. Where your life is not based or limited on your natural circumstances, but on what God wants to do and what he has established through the gospel. And this is why, this is why we have to preach the gospel. This is why we have to communicate to you what the word of God is. This is why, because it is in the communication of the gospel where the power of God for you to experience your change is manifested. Woo, glory to God. Jesus says, I'm not ashamed, or Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So the gospel has the power to shift your life. More specifically, in this instance, what we're talking about today, the gospel has the power to bring about healing and wholeness and deliverance 
for every area of your life. And we see this corroborated all throughout scripture. Let's look at Matthew chapter four, verse 23. Let's see what happens with Jesus when he's preaching the gospel. The Bible says this, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread about throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. I need you to get this in your heart that Jesus is goes around preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the Bible says that when he's preaching this gospel, he's not just preaching empty words, but he's preaching an opportunity for people to enter into a new reality. And I want you to say this, come on, that as I hear the gospel, come on, of the kingdom, as I hear the gospel of the kingdom, I'm entering into a new reality. I'm entering into new possibilities. I'm entering into new transformations. I'm entering into a new destiny. I'm entering into a new purpose. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You can say amen to that if you want to. <laughs> Bless the Lord. We're entering into something different, into something new. It's because of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Let's go a few chapters forward because I need you to see this clearly and without uh, any doubt. The Bible says this, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Man, that boy good. I, I just felt that. That boy good, man. He goes around every teaching in all the villages, all the cities, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming, proclaiming, ministering, sharing the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, remember, why is Jesus doing this? For several reasons, but one of them being what we know from Apostle Paul's verse in Romans 1 16, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Meaning this is that the proclamation, the preaching of the gospel is the power of God to create a new state and or a new reality in those who hear. Glory to God, which is why when Jesus went about preaching the gospel or proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the Bible says that he also was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. I want you just to shout all of them. Come on, say all of them. Jesus went about doing good and healing all of them. Hallelujah. Why? Because he was giving them an opportunity to enter into a new state or a new reality by virtue of the gospel. Oh, shall I proceed? <laughs> yes, indeed. Let's go. Luke chapter nine, verse number one. Come on, let's see what Jesus did to others. Watch this. And he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform what? Healing. Oh my, oh my, come on. Jesus sends his disciples, the 12 disciples out. And he says, listen, y'all, I'm giving you the same power and authority that I have, or at least a delegation of my authority and power for you to be able to preach the gospel and with this communication of the gospel to perform healing. Why? Because it is the preaching of the gospel that creates a new state, come on, for people who hear it to enter into a new reality, a new opportunity. Glory to Jesus. And I'm declaring to you today that as you hear this gospel of the kingdom of God, the preaching of this good news of the kingdom, that you yourself are going to enter into a new state, into a new arena of possibility in every area of your life, that all disease, all sickness will be released from your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Say amen to that. Come on. Hallelujah. I hear you, Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo! Jesus preaches this great gospel of the kingdom of God. I love you, Lord. 
Come on, the Bible says as he does it, he's, all, he's healing all disease, all kind of sickness. Now let's look at the next chapter because it didn't just stop with the 12. Let's see what happens in Luke chapter 10. It says this, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. So he didn't just take the 12 disciples of the apostles of the Lamb, but he took 12, I mean, 70 other folk. And he sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and the place where himself was going. And he said this, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he sends them out. Glory to God. And he says, here's what he says. Luke 10, 8. He says, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you. I hear you, Lord. And Heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Oh, glory to God. And let's see their testimony. Hallelujah. Look at verse number 17. The 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. <laughs> Come on, man. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Mm. Glory to God. Notice this. Even the 70 other. These aren't the main disciples. These aren't the ones who are, whose names are written, are, you know, who, whom God has elevated in the eternal status as the apostles, the 12 apostles. It wasn't these guys. It was 70 others who also were able to minister and to perform in the healing and deliverance ministry because why? They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Come on. Because why? Whenever the gospel is preached under the authority of Christ, then what happens is that healing and deliverance of all disease and all affliction is meant to occur. You got to say amen to that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because why? It is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, meaning it is God's ability. It is God's force. It is God's might. The Greek word for power is dunamis. It is God's uh, 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 strength, vigor, energy. It is that grace that God has given to be able to bring about a new state of righteous existence. Come on, can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. And so what we've got to understand is that this gospel, this great gospel that we are given, that we are graced with, that we have the ability to share, come on, it's not just meant to speak to you and to create a new future for you when you die but it is to create a new reality for you right now while you're living. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, this is why I am gung ho about preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is why we are kingdom out here, be kingdomed out here. It's because I want you to receive the possibilities of the kingdom of God. Jesus told Nicodemus in John three, he says this, that in order to see and enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You've got to be born of the water and the spirit. Glory to God. Because why? Unless you are born again, you cannot see, nor can you enter into the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you this because God, hallelujah, I feel the Holy Ghost. God has for you change right now. God has for you a new state, a new existence, a new reality that he wants you to enter into. And the way that you step foot into it, the way that you gain access to it is by the proclamation of the kingdom of God, by declaring to those who would listen and saying that the kingdom of God, the power of God, the strength of God, the might of God, the culture, the system of God is here for you right now to enter into. Glory to God. Glory to God. 
Come on, even on your sick bed in the hospital, glory to God. Even right where you are, you might be feeling sick, you might be having challenges. It is through the proclamation of this kingdom of God where God says that healing is, Ill, I mean, excuse me, sickness is illegal in this kingdom. Disease is unlawful in this kingdom. It is not allowed to stay. It is not allowed to linger on because Jesus is Lord and he has declared that your freedom must be nigh. Glory to God. Because when you receive the word of truth, when you receive the word of God, the Bible says, and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And I'm telling you right now that when you receive this truth that God has established you and positioned you and has dared you to enter into the kingdom of God, you will recognize that the healing, the affliction, the poverty, the lack, the sickness, the despair, the demonic oppression that is afflicting your life, that is harassing you, cannot stay. Glory to God. Come on, because the kingdom is here. Hallelujah. Come on, embrace the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Like never before, embrace his goodness, embrace his grace, embrace his power, embrace his possibility. The kingdom of God is here right now to destroy, glory to God, the effects of cancer, to destroy the effects and even the very root of cancer, to destroy the very root and the effects of diabetes, come on, of hypertension in the name of Jesus, of hallucinations, of mental disease and mental to imbalances. I'm telling you right now, the kingdom of God has come to you as Jesus and with, with Jesus as its king. And you must be healed in the name of Jesus. I don't care how you feel about it. You got to be healed. Come on. Jesus has come for you to experience and to enter into this great truth and this great reality that healing belongs to those who belong to Jesus. Woo! Come on, you better hear that again. Healing belongs to those who belong to Jesus. <laughs> and we sing a song in the old church, I'm yours, Lord. <laughs> everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I have, everything I've got, I'm yours, Lord. Come on. Glory to God. Healing belongs to those who belong to Jesus. Come on, because this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you. This is God's agenda for you. Because when the kingdom of God comes, the reign of Satan has to be abolished. The reign of Satan has to be abolished. I love the Lord for this. My God, I hope you're getting this today because God wants you healed. My God, God wants you healed. God wants you healed and he has given you an opportunity to step into that. You don't have to wait until you die. It's, God's not, it's not God's will for you to be sick. Come on, God has not put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. The only person that God has put sickness on is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew chapter eight, verse number 17, come on, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Matthew chapter eight, verse 17. Let's look it up. Look it up. <laughs> You'd, you'd have to be there. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Come on. When, they, when the evening came, they brought to Jesus many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. You see, the Lord doesn't need you to carry sickness to teach you something because he put sickness and disease on Jesus. What are you going to carry? What are you, what are you going to carry for Jesus? Hello? He put that on him. You don't have to carry that. <laughs> it's not for you. Jesus doesn't need to. God doesn't need you to carry sickness and disease when he put it all on Jesus. Does he need you to carry sin as well? No. You say, I'm free from sin, pastor. I'm free from sin. I'm set free from sin by what Jesus did on the cross because the Lord put the wrath of sin on him so that I may have life. Come on, he who knew no sin, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, he became sin for us that we, come on, through him might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. So if Jesus put, if God put all sin on Jesus, and there's no more sin for you to carry, then in the same way, if he himself took our infirmities and our diseases, that means that there is no more sickness that you have to carry 
for the sake of righteousness. Hello. There is no more sickness. There is no disease. There is no malady. Come on. There is no illness that you have to carry as a believer. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. In order to walk or to prove or engage in righteousness. Hallelujah. <laughs> because nobody would say that about sin. Oh, I got I to gotta carry this adultery for Jesus. I'm doing this for the Lord. I know I'm doing this for the Lord. <laughs> nobody would tell you. Nobody would agree with that, would they? Now, some of y'all would probably like that, and you need, you need to repent. <laughs> you, need to, you might need to get saved. I don't know, man. I'm worried about you. <laughs> Come on now. We're not cheating on our spouses. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm doing this for the Lord. You need to get saved, man. That's funny, but it's, it's not funny. It's wrong. <laughs> Help Jesus. Like you're stealing for God. Like, Lord, I don't mean to take this 20,000 from this, this old woman, but I'm doing this for you. Like what? Come on now. Nobody in their right mind would agree with that because he took it once and for all, paid the price. And if he did that for sin, then I'm telling you that he did the same exact thing for your sickness and disease. He himself took. You don't got to take it. You don't have to carry it. You don't have to embrace it anymore. Come on, we can go to where this verse was actually uh, derived from. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Glory to God. Come on, watch this. Here's what it says. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgression. I got I to gotta switch to King James because you can't, you can't say this verse the right way when you preach when I was saying in the King James way. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Come on, say amen to that. Hallelujah. You better get this. You don't have to carry it any longer. Same way you don't have to carry sin because Jesus took it for you, is the same way you don't have to carry sickness and disease. It is not for you to carry. God is not putting it on you to teach you a message or lesson because he put all sickness on Jesus. In the same way, God does not put sin on you to teach a lesson. He's like, you know what? Let me afflict you <laughs> with covetousness because I'm going to teach you something. I need to teach you something. That's so stupid. It's just incongruent and it doesn't fit, does it? But we say these things because it makes us feel good. It's maybe a religiosity based concept or terminology or even ideology, but that's not the Bible. He himself took our diseases and bore our infirmities. He took your cancer. Come on. Yes, Lord. Come on. He took those migraines. He took lit lupus. Come on. He took every kidney. He took a, a lung infection. He took respiratory disease. He took it all. Come on. He took sickle cell. He has taken it all. The devil is a liar. Glory to Jesus. Watch this. James 1 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away, carried away and enticed by his own lust. Come on, God can't be tempted by evil and that he doesn't tempt anyone. So God doesn't put evil upon you to teach you something. God gives you faith to teach you. Woo, come on. He gives you faith to teach you. He doesn't give you evil to teach you. He gives you faith. Hallelujah. So meaning this, he doesn't put sin on you to teach you how to not... Come on, how to stop, come on. If you struggle with lust, he doesn't say, you know what? Let me give him some more lust. That'll teach him. Does he do that? No. What he does is he gives you faith to fight, to overcome, to walk by faith, to walk in the pathways of God so that you can walk by the spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So God gives us faith so that we can overcome the obstacles that we face, so that we can learn from him. God doesn't need to give you sickness or disease so that you can learn from God. That's, that's, that's just not even Bible. There's, there's nothing in the Bible that would suggest that. Why? Because he took it. <laughs> Jesus took it. He took all the sickness. There's no more sickness that God, that God, even if he wanted to, 
Jesus already took it. <laughs> he took all of our infirmities, all of our sorrows, all of our sickness. Come on, all of our diseases in the name of Jesus. You better say amen to that and quit playing with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So receive your healing today in Jesus' name. Be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Woo, come on. Sariah says be healed in Jesus' name. Sciatica, be healed in Jesus' name. May the grace and the power of God reach you right now and cause faith to rise up and to be engendered in you to create a new day because the kingdom of God has come near you in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God, in the mighty name of Jesus, the kingdom of God has come near you. Hallelujah. Let's keep going. Mm -mm -mm. So the way the kingdom of God works is that you ha it has to be enforced in order for its truths and realities to be experienced. It's got to be enforced. It has to be enforced for its truths and realities to be experienced. Meaning that the kingdom of God does not operate automatically, but it operates by enforcing of principles, laws, and truths. All right? Think about this. A nation has laws, but without law enforcement, those laws are meaningless. They only serve as some decorative or um, idealistic expression of what we hope for. Without enforcement of those laws, you have no real government. You have piece of, a piece of paper with words on them, but without enforcement of those words, of those laws, of those statutes, you don't have a government. You don't have a nation based on those laws, which is kind of like one of the problems that we saw on the border. When we don't enforce the laws, then you will see a violation of said laws. In America, we saw that violation to the tune of 15 to 20 million undocumented illegal immigrants flooding into our nation. Why? Because the laws were not enforced. Listen to me. When there is no enforcement of law, there is no oper functional operation of government. Without, without the enforcement of law, <laughs> the kingdom or that government has no ability or has no real presence or no jurisdiction. Hallelujah. Now think about this in terms of the spirit of God. Think about this in terms of the kingdom of God on the spiritual sense is that when we do not enforce the kingdom of God, oh, bless his name. When we don't enforce the principles of God, when we don't enforce the word of God, then you cannot have an effect or a manifestation of said kingdom because the kingdom of God requires you to enforce it in order for its presence to be manifested, which is why Jesus, although he is present as the king, come on, Jesus is the king of the kingdom. If you didn't know that, now you know. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. He is its Christ. He is our ruler. He is the king. Hallelujah. But until he begins to enforce it, his kingship, it means little. The Bible says that when the come on, when the the wise men from the east came, they came looking for him who was born king. Think about that for a second. Jesus was born king. He came out the womb king, which is already in itself something that has never been seen before in humanity. Born king? That's wild. But yet, without his ability to enforce the kingdom of God, his kingship had no practical meaning in the earth. 
His kingship had such little practicality that even his brothers and his sisters and his family thought that he was crazy. They said, Jesus, you're doing too much, man. What are you? What is this stuff you're doing, man? He said, you got all these people in your home. You're healing all kinds of stuff. You're causing all kind of ruckus and riling up all the religious leaders. Jesus, you're crazy. He's tripping right now. Why is that? Because he had 30 years without manifestation or enforcing the reality of the kingdom of God. And so what happens is when Jesus starts to enforce the kingdom of God and its realities change and shift and he starts to let me fix my crown real quick. Let me let y'all know who running it. <laughs> Glory to God. What happens is that the people around them most say, like, wait a minute, you, you crazy, Jesus. Because they weren't used to him enforcing the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God has to be enforced. See, here's the moral of the story. This is why we preach the gospel, because we're not just preaching the gospel just to tell you information, but the gospel is preached to enforce the realities and the laws of the kingdom. Hallelujah. So our proclamation of the kingdom is literally the finger of God displacing and disrupting what the devil would try to do and violate in your life. That border, my God, of your life. Come on. There's a line that says no, no sickness is allowed here. There's a line that says in this kingdom of God, in your life as a child of God, no uh, un, uh, uh, disruption of your peace is not allowed. Come on. Anxiety is not allowed. Uh, uh, poverty and lack is not allowed on this line. But if you don't enforce it, you will have territories, come on, you will have, excuse me, terrorists come over the border of your life and begin to inflict whatever they want to do and violate the real, the rules of the kingdom of God that you are in because you don't enforce it. Because you don't enforce healing, this means that sickness then will try to creep up on you. And if it finds your home, your house, your life, your mind vulnerable, it will operate however it wants to. Because you're not enforcing it. Ooh. Come on. Disease. Come. If you don't enforce it, they're going to come across the border of your soul and take you captive, and take your space. Come on, hear what I'm telling you in the spirit. You have to enforce it. John chapter 20, verse 23, we get an example of this. Come on, of the need to enforce. You even, if you want to retain sin or forgive sins, here's what Jesus says, verse 22 of chapter 20 of John. It says, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. What do we see here? Well, what we see here is that either forgiveness of sins or the retention of sins is based upon how they enforced it. Come on. Now, this was referring to within the community of the church. Hallelujah. This is not from a salvific perspective in the sense that you get to forgive sins for somebody. Somebody needs to say like, I forgive you, my son. No, we, we don't do that. We can't do that. This is talking about from a community perspective. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who has forgives on sin? Who has authority to forgive sins on earth but the son of man? Come on. We come to Christ Jesus to be forgiven of sins. Hallelujah. Now watch this. But together, if you violate me as a believer, or I violate you as a believer, which you know I would never do because I'm the pastor, right? <laughs> but if you violate somebody, somebody violates you, then we have to judge to say, okay, if we forgive, it's forgiven. If we retain it, no, you wrong, you wrong, right? It's retained. But, but forget about that instance, but just hear what the principle is, is that the power to forgive the sins within the community or the power to retain sins in the community is by the enforcing of the people. Meaning this, it's not automatic. The kingdom of God has to be operated and engaged by enforcement. Meaning that somebody has to put into practice what the principles and the, uh, the standards and the statutes of the kingdom are. 
And this is why Jesus went and proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. Glory to God. He's not just telling a story, but he's beginning to enforce the will of God. He's enforcing the mind of God. He's enforcing God's culture and God's system on anyone or anybody, come on, who would receive it. Glory to God. By faith. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. Change and impact doesn't come by the presence or the fact of truth alone, but it comes by proclamation, by enforcement. This is why <laughs> we can say this, although the verse doesn't explicitly mean this, there is implicit truth here that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Amen. Here is the, here's the reality is that is what you say or don't say can heavily impact your future. Now that story in eight in Proverbs is referring to specifically how you engage with wisdom between one another. It's not a metaphysical or supernatural verse by nature in the sense of you can speak things that aren't and they'll be. It's not referring to that. Not in the context of how it's written. But the principles are true, is that what you say or don't say impacts your future. What you say or don't say, the wisdom which you communicate with to other people, the wisdom how you deal in business deals, the wisdom with how you deal with your spouse, it all impacts your future, how you deal with your children. It impacts how you deal with your siblings, how you deal with your parents. It all impacts on that level. But, but, glory to God, the truth remains the same is that if we don't enforce the kingdom of God, then death and or life becomes our privilege. Because if I don't, if you don't proclaim the kingdom of God and proclaim what God has spoken to you by the word of God, then what happens is then you are going to allow and pro permit the, the aggression of the enemy in your life. You hear what I'm telling you? It's going to be by your words. It's going to be by your enforcement of the kingdom of God. Come on, the Bible says this, that, that we having the same spirit of faith, saying that we believe, therefore also we, what? We speak. Come on, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah, that's enforcement. That's enforcing. That's enforcing the will of God, the kingdom of God. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So for your life to shift, for you to experience the power of God unto salvation, there has to be a proclamation or an enforcement of that will, of that kingdom. Come on, and this is what Jesus does. For three years, he goes to all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. Are you hearing me, church? Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. So this means this, is that you're not just going to be healed just because the law is present, because the word has been present. Your healing doesn't come just because Jesus died on the cross as a fact. Your healing doesn't come just because the, uh, hallelujah, God's system, blessed his name, has been established. The kingdom has been established in the earth. Your change will come by the proclamation of the kingdom of God and your hearing of it and your believing upon it by faith. This is why people will say, well, how come when I get saved, I don't automatically get healed? I don't know. How come you don't automatically get saved? The moment you come out of your mother's womb, you don't, do you? No, nope. the gospel has to be enforced. Someone has to preach to you. According to Romans chapter 10, you have to hear it with faith and you have to believe. Nothing is automatic. Everything has to be enforced. Glory to God. So you're healing. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm declaring to you in the name of Jesus. Come on, as an authorized representative of the kingdom of God, I'm declaring to you that the kingdom of God has come near you right now. 
hallelujah, that your healing is here for you right now. Glory to God. Come on. Congenital diseases. Healing is for you right now in the name of Jesus. Even poor sight, maybe blindness or glaucoma. I see someone with situation in their eyes. Healing is yours right now by the virtue and the power of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Come on. Receive it in Jesus name. We're enforcing this power. We're enforcing this strength for you to receive right now. Glory to God, because it's not going to happen automatically. Somebody's got to enforce it. And you receive that enforcement by your belief, by your belief, by your acceptance and the expression of your faith in you saying, Lord, I believe. Therefore, I speak. What are you going to say? I'm healed in the name of Jesus. What are you going to declare? I am delivered in the name of Jesus. What are you going to decree that my life will no longer be bound or shackled by the devil? In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God. Come on, I receive my healing. That's what you, I receive my healing in the name of Jesus. Come on, by your belief, by your belief, hallelujah. So we enforce it by the proclamation to you, and then you enforce it by your belief. Come on, Romans chapter 10, verse 8, 9, it says this. Come on, once you've heard the gospel, I love the Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. Come on. But what does it say? The word is near you. That means the law. Hallelujah. That means the principles, the edicts of the kingdom of God is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Oh, my God. Whoever believes in the word of God will not be disappointed. I'm telling you today that you will not be disappointed, that your healing is nigh and that you are healed in Jesus. Jesus name, that you're going to go to the doctor. You're going to look in the mirror. You're going to feel it. You're going to get up and walk. And it's not going to be the same because you are healed in Jesus mighty name, because you confess with your mouth. Come on. And you believe in your heart. I know the Lord is real. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Say it's mine today. Hallelujah. Come on. And I receive it. See, this is enforcement. So we as preachers, Come on, we enforce the kingdom of God by the proclamation. The hearers have your job is to believe and receive it. Come on. By the communication of your mouth and the communication of your heart. The Bible says if you do that, you will not be disappointed. Here's what I'm telling you this right now. Woo, Rabbi Mashake Ando. So your season of disappointment is over in Jesus' name. Come on, that time, the era of you being disappointed in your health is over in Jesus' mighty name. Some of you, there are things of wisdom that you need to do that will shift it immediately. Others, come on, there are things that you can't do for by changing your diet, by eating certain kind of foods that'll change it. But but let me tell you this, that your season of disappointment in your health is ended in the name of Jesus. It is ended in the name of Jesus. It is over in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, say amen. Come on, say I receive. That devil's a liar. You're coming up. Your change has come. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe, all who would receive. And I'm telling you right now, today is your day. Now is your time. Come on, to step into this healing. We're enforcing, we're putting up the barriers. We're reinforcing the boundaries of the kingdom of God and saying to the devil, you shall not pass. (laughs) You shall not pass. You shall not pass. And we're prosecuting every devil. Thank you, Jesus. Every spirit, come on, every sickness, every disease that would try to harass and hinder us in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, say amen to that. I want you to lift your hands right where you are. Come on and say, Lord, I receive. Come on, the power of the kingdom of God. And today I enter into this truth 
Come on, by my repentance and my belief. According to Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. I'm entering into a new day, a new moment, a new time. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Mm. I receive my healing in his name. I receive my breakthrough in his name. I receive my change in the mighty name of Jesus. By the power and the presence of the kingdom of God being established in my life. Amen. And amen. I see somebody's life changing. I see some, I, I literally see the kingdom of God literally squashing out. Come on. Oh, bless his name. The power of God's word beginning to root out at Talaman. So come on. The Bible says that the Lord is a strong tower in the day of trouble. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Another verse says the righteous run therein and are saved. Come on. I, I literally see the kingdom of God, God's strength and power, literally erecting boulders and boundaries around your life, <laughs> around your health right now in the name of Jesus. So you're entering into a new day and a new season, but you must enforce it by your belief, and by your confession. As you hear this gospel, as you hear this word preached to you, receive it and believe it today. And I'm telling you that you're going to have great testimony this year in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on, if you're watching today and you're not born again, first of all, the first thing that you need to do is get saved. What are you doing? You might not have known, but Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you to save you from your sins, to save you from sickness, disease, poverty, lack, to save you from the oppression of the devil. Hallelujah. Come on, and I want you to believe this right now. Oh, God. I want you to believe this right now, that your change is here, and that you enter into that by receiving this great, glorious gospel of the kingdom of God. Can you say amen to that? You receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. You need to be born again. You need to be saved. It's very simple. But I want you to do this right now. I want you to, right where you are, the devil's a liar. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Come on, say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. I confess you are the Son of God and my Lord forever. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead on the third day with all authority in heaven and earth that I may be justified. Right now, I believe that my sins are forgiven. I'm justified by your blood. I am born again. I am saved. I am a child of God. I am free from the power of sin to serve the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for receiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Glory to God. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it from your heart, sincerely, what I need you to do right now is to stop whatever you're doing, scan this QR code, and or text the word Jesus to the number 929-209-2377. Do that right now. Do that right now. Do it right now. Text the word Jesus to the number 929-209-2377. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm, we give you praise today, Lord. We give you praise today. Come on, text it right now. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to be born again. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're watching today and you don't have a church home or you need a church home to worship at, you need a family, you need a church family, I want you to connect with our church, Next Level Church here in New York City. Listen, whether you're here in New York City or whether you're across the country, it doesn't matter. We have means and ways to connect you for real so you can be a part of our covenant community. Amen. We have means for you. We want you to be a part. What you need to do is, but just make that step of faith right now. Text the word church to the number 2092, sorry, 929 or scan this QR code right here. Amen. That you see on the bottom of the screen or text the word church to the number 929 Do that right now.
in Jesus name. Listen, we're so grateful for you and excited for all that God is doing in the mighty name of Jesus. We love the Lord today. Glory to God. Glory to God. Listen, I also want to give you an opportunity if you didn't get a chance to give today. Listen, it's imperative that we honor God through our giving, that we take those steps to do what God has called us, commanded us to do. We give our tithe to the Lord, which is the tenth of our increase. So whatever we earn, whatever we generate, we give God a tenth. Amen. Because that is just a representation of our honor, of our respect, of our worship to him as God, as sovereign, as king of our lives. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Do that with us. I know it may seem impossible, but you have to know that as you do this, God will supply all your needs. He promises that he'll supply all your needs. He promises that he will take care of us. He promises that we will never be uh, uh, forsaken nor beg bread ever, never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever. Come on, when we operate by the kingdom of God, so we want you to do that right now. Come on, let's make the devil lie. I want you to take that step of faith and say, Lord, I receive today. Come on, and I'm giving today. I'm going to give today. Maybe you want to give an offering today. Maybe the Lord is, you've been impacted by this teaching. You want to sow a seed. You're believing God for something great. I want you to sow a seed of faith today. Come on, a significant seed today to the Lord. Right? You can do that again. Text the Scan the QR code or text the word GIVE, number 929-209-2377. Or you can visit our website, inextlevel.org forward slash GIVE. And you can uh, give in that capacity. All right, listen, that's it for today. We're so grateful that you're here. I bless you today. Be healed. Shoot us information of testimonies. Man, I love to hear testimonies. Believe in God for great things for you. And we want you to lock in, all right? Glory to God. Come on, let me pray for you. Let's get out of here. Lift your hands, repeat after me. Say, surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And I may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost rest, rule, and abide with you henceforth now and forevermore. Be blessed. Be changed. Be healed. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, family. We'll see you next time. Peace and blessings, everyone.